Chris Gowser here with Matt Howell. This week on the first run, Matt and I find ourselves just staring at the closest mirror, taking a long look at ourselves aging, just getting so very old, and decide to discuss Coralie Farge's The Substance. Demi Moore returns with a powerhouse performance in possibly the most divisive horror film of the year. There's the gonna. No. No. There's then going to be the life splitting rundown of the big releases on physical media, featuring your streaming and straight to DVD video picks of the week, brought to you by Viper Video Tampa. And then Matt and I are going to share our five favorite body horror films. I am sure going through this episode, folks. I had a tooth pulled last week, and I'm having some bad reactions this week. A little bit of pain, hurricane bearing down, but we're going to just knock this sucker out because. We love you, and I don't want to leave you hanging this upcoming weekend, even if I am in pain and I lose my house, there's flooding, all these other things. It doesn't matter. Only you and your satisfaction matters. That's what I'm all about. So let's hear a clip from The Substance to start off this party that may be the end of me. Have you ever dreamt of a better version of yourself? Younger. More beautiful. More perfect. One single injection unlocks your DNA, starting a new cellular division that will release another version of yourself. This is The Substance. Matt, The Substance. Just roaring crowds of approval at Khan. One best original screenplay. See, people seem to really be all on board for this thing. And, uh, but it turns out it seems to be pretty divisive. Some people don't care for the film or its potential feminist politics. Other people seem to be all in. Matt, let's start everything off though. What is Substance all about? So Elizabeth Sparkle is a fading celebrity. She is a fitness guru played by Demi Moore and she's on her way out. Um, she's going to be fired from her show and, uh, her career is at an end or at least in a transition to something that she's not used to because as Chris said, she is getting older and uh, people don't value uh, people in, as they get older in the entertainment industry, especially women. And uh, she gets in a car accident and she goes to the doctor and the nurse puts her on to something called the substance. And he says it changed his life. Well, she decides to pursue it and take the substance when a much younger version of herself is created and they have to share a life. Mm, so that's how it works. So you have to, every seven days, they got to swap back and forth, right? Mm-hmm. And there's a stabilizer chemical as well that has to be used. But if you take a little bit too much, there's some, maybe some adverse reactions And as the kids say, hilarity or chaos ensues when (laughs) one person decides to take a little more time. So this is interesting, Matt. Uh, Farge, and I'm, you know what? I really should do my homework and looked up how to say that. Mm -hmm. Is it Farge? What do you think? It certainly isn't Fargit because she is French. Uh, I would assume it's Farge. I don't really know. She's Frenchy now. Yeah. So her, she lists a few influences, uh, Cronenberg, Carpenter, and Lynch. Hmm. And I feel like if I were to describe this film to you, I would those names would all come up in that description. <laughs> How does substance work for you, Matt? Is it divisive? Are you on the fence? Did you hate it? Did you love it? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think overall I ended up loving this film. I think it is hmm. com- very unsubtle at all. Like it just takes its message oh, yeah. and just keeps beating you over the head with it for two and a half hours straight. Um, so I guess as far as if you're looking for a, you know, something subtle that you have to pull out uh, the different pieces and layers. Well, nope, it's kind of all laid bare there for you at the beginning. Uh, I, you know, thought the visuals were great. I love the style of just the way she shoots the film, the, like the long red hallways, um, Dennis mm-hmm. Quaid just being this manic, disgusting weirdo is just mm-hmm. chef's kiss. Wonderful <laughs> throughout the whole thing. And it's, you know, and it turns disgusting and titillating and, um, you know, sad and, and funny at times as well. So overall, I think it's very, very successful. I was really on board with this. Um, 
to kind of ape another French filmmaker, it reminded me of uh, watching something like Climax to an extent, where it's just kind of like a relentless visual audio assault. Like even in the clip that Chris just played, that thumping music is just right. everywhere in this thing. If I had one complaint, actually, maybe it's maybe about 20 minutes too long. Maybe they could have shaved a little time off of it because as you get towards the end, it starts to drag a little bit, especially as you kind yeah. of get to the 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 climax, if you were. But overall, I, I think it was incredibly successful. Yeah. The first thing that popped in my head when I walked out of this film was, wow, that was a lot. <laughs> well, Matt, I agree with Matt. It's unsettling. It's horrifying, and the big surprise for me is also, it's funny. And for me, this is like a Grimm's kind of fairy tale for a modern generation. And I agree with Matt. This film has no time for subtlety. Farge has something to say, and she is going to smack you upside the head with it over and over again. I got to say, initially, I was, Matt, a little concerned that we're leaning too much into the male gaze, right? trying to prove a point with these zoomed-in shots of Quayley's body, basically, kind of over and over again. And I don't think, like, man, that she's just trying to satisfy the degenerates like Matt, right? But she counterbalances that by making Quaid probably the most disgusting creature in the film, or at least as disgusting as she can possibly make him, with these really long, almost interminable uh, close-ups that are distorted with like a fisheye lens. So we're looking at a funhouse mirror, basically, of all the typical standard males, particularly the ones in Hollywood, rubbing it in their faces, like the dog that poos in the house, just over and over again, right? Just to show, no, bad, bad, bad. Which, by the way, is abusive. You shouldn't do that to a dog. But casting more as well, Matt, I think is a stroke of genius. When you look at her career, how she was treated, the role she played. It's pitch perfect casting for more. And I will say too, that this is possibly the finest work she has ever done. And it was just a really a, a riveting, unsettling experience from the very beginning throughout the entire runtime for me. And there's so many great little moments. And like the fact that more, her character is using food as a punishment for Sue, right? Because she knows the impact that that would have on her. Because again, they're still the same body. So that one thing that happens to one will impact the other, right? And all these different references, it's a feast for the horror fan, all these different homages. At one point, she includes Bernard Herrmann's uh, scene, the more the love scene score from Vertigo. Right, there are shining references, the fly, the thing, a racer head. Insert your Cronenberg reference here. I I don't know. But it is just a repulsive in your face statement that I think is all better served by how over the top it is. And I yeah, I really appreciated and I don't know if it is enjoyed the right word. I, I think it I think it is. I think it is. If you're in the right mindset for this thing, I think you're going to... It is shocking, but also has, I think, a startling, important message. And I think everybody should see it, I think. But just be wary. <laughs> it, it is really unsettling at times. Probably for the majority, almost, of its runtime, man. Yeah, so... I guess technical question, story question. Yeah. What was unclear to me, can they remember what the other person did? So, or, because that was not clear to me. Like, is is Sue a completely indistinct individual and, like, Lizzie Sparkle can't remember any of the stuff she's doing so she doesn't even get to experience it? Yeah, I don't think they, they don't seem to have a shared memory because when they do things to each other, they don't, the, 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 rebound or the alternate whatever when things switch back they don't they're they're shocked by the things that they encounter in the apartment mm -hmm. right or whatever the case may be so i don't yeah no i don't i don't think they have a shared memory but there is a biological connection between the two of them i think and at least independent of that mm. makes you wonder why you would do it then if you can't remember it's not like you're living another life but i guess you but it's still her the whole time in a weird way i guess it's 
I think that's one of the reasons why the food thing is so devious to me because it is her, mm-hmm. and she, you know, so she knows the things that are the uh, traps and punishments. I hate to say that; it's not the right way to put that, but the challenges for her are that too. And another thing too I love is that her name is Sue. Like, there's never any question of what her last name is, which kind of just <laughs> adds to the adult fairy tale feel of everything. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. Sure. It doesn't matter. Right. And uh, yeah. No, I, I, yeah, no, I think there's a few things that may not make 100% sense upon deep introspection, but I don't know if that's really what we're going for. I think not, we're too focused on fountains of blood from severed body parts or whatever the case may be that are uh, covering all of our guests at a particular show. I don't know. <laughs> But I, I like Matt. You're right. Though, like the Shining reference too. You have, and even some Yalo, Yalo stuff too. Yeah. Right. And the, so you get the Shining with I think the carpet in the hallway at the eight at Quaid's office is similar to the Shining hotel to the Overlook Hotel. Mm-hmm. Though it's not. I don't think it's it's a, it's not an exact match. But also the long red corridor, right? Which of course uh, not only portends things to come that things will maybe be covered in blood, but are also just reminiscent of Giallo's and also I think Kubrick. I think. Yeah, there's. If you are steeped in classic film horror lore, man, this thing is just a. Uh, it's like walking through, I don't know, like a museum of all these class, classic references. But she still has something distinct to say using all of these classic techniques. Yeah, I mean, and honestly, you know, I don't know. It, the The message is the message, but it can also be interpreted in certain ways. So you know, there is some depth to it as well. Oh, sure. Absolutely. What do you think about more? Do you think the Academy or the Globes or whomever, horror films for the most part, tend not to get their due when it comes to mm-hmm. um, awards recognition? Yeah. I think more is that good in this. Do you think she gets any uh, uh, honors? Maybe maybe at least from Independent Spirit Awards at the very least? Uh, maybe Independent Spirit. I bet you're right. I don't think any of the big awards are going to give her because A, it's a horror film, and B, I don't think that... Uh... Hollywood is all about uh, when a mirror is being held up to it. And, and yeah, uh, they're not I big fans of that, are they? Uh, yeah, I don't <laughs> think just those two things I think are going to sink it. Yeah, I just found this film. To, I'm just still this is a thing that just kind of washes over you. And I'm still taking it all in. I, I felt it was just, just a deeply personal exhibition for Farge and more for that matter. And the two of them together are just uh, fantastic in this. And uh I don't know if you've seen... Have you seen Revenge, her first film? Yeah, didn't we do it for the show? Did we? I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is very good, too. Uh, Mm -hmm. So if you haven't seen that, I think it's on Shudder. You should definitely check it out. But, uh, Matt, I'm going to give the substance... uh, For the sheer artistry, audacity, and grossness, uh, I'm giving the substance an A. And the technique... Yeah, I I think... mm, I was at an A through most of it, but I think I'm going to go to an A minus just because at some point, and I don't know if it was just because it was late and I'm old and it's, you know, a work night that I'm watching this thing where it's like, Ooh, I'm getting a little tired here. I'm, I'm kind of worn yeah. out from watching this thing. So I think that's the only reason I'm going to knock it down a slight bit for me. All right. So an A minus because Matt is old. That is uh <laughs> fair enough. I guess that ties fair. in a way. Cool. S- so uh, if you've got a chance to see The Substance, which is currently in theaters, uh, please check it out. Bring the grandkids. They're going to love it. Mm-hmm. And they're going to cry and cry and cry. It's just an email feedback at thefirstrun.com. Of course, we'd always love to hear from you. Matt, what's uh, coming up on physical media this upcoming Tuesday? i got a few things to talk about, too, as well. So we'll see how far I get given my oral injury. Boy, that doesn't sound good. Anyway, uh, here's something that's coming out. <laughs> Do you know what this is? No. no, no. Oh my god. Sorosky. Careful. Please hurry. I'll be quick. Scarlet, stop it. Come on. I have to scan these markings. I'm not leaving. You must leave. No. Now. I can hear them. My father searched his entire life for this. I can't leave now. I have to get this. Sorry, Scarlet. I have a family. I know. It's okay. Be careful. I won't be long. Be careful. Come on. Come on, Scarlet.
looking back, that clip is really relies a lot on the image. I think the audio doesn't really make any sense, does it? <laughs> that is a clip from uh, "As Above, So Below." Scream Factory is putting out a collector's edition of the film. I'm not a big fan of that film. I, I never did not care for it when I saw it in the theater. But it seems to have a very rabid fan base. I don't know. Do you remember uh, seeing that? I do remember seeing it. I think, we, again, I think we watched it for the show as we've seen almost every movie that's come out in the last 15 years for the show. But, uh, yeah, I, I remember not being impressed by it, but I have seen the kind of rabid devotion that people online have to it. So I, I want to watch it again just to see if I'm wrong in this. Yeah, so you got a couple uh, new interviews included at, on that set, and uh, that is your... Number five! Okay, number four? Four! I'm going to go with Burn Witch Burn, also known as Night of the Eagle from 1962. You get a brand new 4K restoration of that. This is being released by Kino Lorber. This was previously, I should say, restored by Studio Canal. A brand new audio commentary by novelist and critic Tim Malukas. Uh, an old commentary by the screenwriter Richard Matheson. Interview with an actor... And uh, and more. So uh, there's that. You got that going for you. What's next, Matt? Can you hit it from there? I got three shots. That's enough. Can't argue with a confident man. I'm like pulling stuff out of my mouth. I'm getting really nervous about my dentistry here. <laughs> I'm very uncomfortable. Uh, Arrow is putting out the Jorg Budigeret. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Collection known as Memento Mori. This is an Arrow video exclusive until October 1st. It includes Necromantic, uh, Der Tadisking, Necromantic 2, and Shram, all uh, high-definition presentations of the film. Uncompressed PCM Sierra 2.0 audio for all films, an additional mono option for Necromantic. Limited edition packaging, which includes an exclusive 100-page rigid bound book. Featuring new writings by David Caracas, author of Sex, Murder, Art, the films of Jorg Budigeret. Sorry if I'm, so, I'm uh, massacring that. There's also a comic book sequel included with it called Son of Necromantic. And then a bonus disc containing the extended cut of Necromantic 2. The home video premiere of the 2020 uh, directed documentary short, uh, Schweichen. And recently on our short films and more. I have also a, an actual original Necromantic 2 16mm film strip. Oh, wow. Now, I have never seen any of the Necromantic films or any of uh, Bougueret's films. Are you familiar? I, I know of them, but I have not seen any of them. I don't even know of them. Well, you're, it's, they're, I think, gross. I think you can probably figure out what's going on in the film called Necromantic. So, that's for you. That's a number two. Uh, right. Arrow, not Arrow, Scream Factory is putting out a pretty nifty-looking steelbook of the 80s version of The Blob, uh, one of my favorite horror films of that decade. So if you're a steelbook fan, you can pick that up. And then finally, Paramount Scares Volume 2 is being released. This is a box set from Paramount. does not include a fifth fifth film this time. Last time, the first set had a surprise fifth film that they announced basically like a week or two before it came out. But this one includes the uh, 4K debuts of Friday the 13th Part 2, the Kurt Russell film Breakdown, World War Z, and Orphan First Kill. That's the uh, Orphan prequel. And um, I already own Orphan First Kill. I already own uh, World War Z. And I have Friday the 13th Part 2 all in Mm Blu-ray. I would probably, at the right price, pick up Part 2, Friday the 13th and 4K individually. I've never seen Breakdown. I hear it's very good, and I'd like to see it. Are you Have you seen Breakdown at all? I have not seen Breakdown, no. Yeah, and then World War Z is, is it's entertaining. Yeah, it's, it's okay. It's fine. Yeah. And then I don't know if I would need to upgrade Orphan uh, First Kill to 4K. It includes a full-size Vangoria, Fangoria magazine, excuse me, four unique iron-on patches, a domed Paramount Scares sticker, as well as a glow-in-the-dark enamel pin and a limited edition poster. So, that Orphan First Kill 4K bothers me. And I got even more upset. Because guess what else was announced that's coming out in 4K? Immaculate. Mm. And I bought that Blu-ray about a month ago. Right. And I have not bought the Final Omen yet because of this. And there's something else, too, I haven't bought, and I'm blanking on what it is. Because uh, I'm just assuming... Then six months there'll be a 4K announcement, but there's the 
the twist, man. I'm sure if people don't buy the Blu-rays, they won't think that there's a market for the 4K and may never release it. Fair. So I'm, I'm upset but torn. Like, I would much rather have the 4K of Immaculate. I don't know what's going to happen for my first Omen. But now I'm upset that I have my uh, Orphan First Kill. I'm sure the Blu-ray transfer I'm, it probably won't be that drastically improved. Or maybe. But it's still, it's, it's unsettling and it's upsetting. And if, mm-hmm. if your market continues to dwindle, I mean, granted, again, I think we are oddly in the golden age of physical media. The stuff that's being restored and released is just crazy. But your audience is small. And I feel like you owe it to your consumers that there's going to be a 4K coming at some point. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it entirely based on the sale of that initial Blu-ray? Or are they taking advantage of people like me, hoping that we'll just go ahead and double dip? What do you think? Yeah, it's tough because obviously you would think that they would just skip Blu-ray altogether. And because I don't think Blu-ray is particularly popular, but it's more popular than 4K. So you would think that they would just skip Blu-ray altogether and just go straight to 4K. Well, I don't know. I, mean, I think I don't know if they look at the sales. Like DVD still outsell everything. Right. But that's just on the strength of Walmart. I think basically right. what that's, that means. Yeah, it's just very, it upsets me. Like Malignant. I would love to have uh, gone straight to the 4K for Malignant. Mm-hmm. Uh, other thing too, I want to give you a heads up on. Uh, I have I've pre-ordered the Second Sight Hitcher 4K, and uh, it's a box set from Second Sight. It's going to run me probably eighty bucks, all in because it's an import. I think when we're done. But I love the Hitcher, and I cannot wait. But if you don't want to spend the money on that, and they are going to have a, a a standalone regular edition too, which I believe will be region free. But there was a domestic announcement made, I think, today on the recording of the show that there will be a single disc kind of release hitcher in 4K here in the States. So if money's a little tight but and you love the hitcher, just hang tight because they're going to get an individual release here. And odds are it'll probably be like 20 bucks. So uh, just want to give people a heads up on that. And then I saw the 430 movie. The uh, screener oh. episode for that has been recorded. Probably be okay. out in a week or so. You'll have to see nice. our uh, responses that for that. Just want to give everybody a heads up and tell Matt, um, no rush. No rush for you. <laughs> and bad. and then uh, finally, I was able to go see Halloween 3 on the big screen here. Uh, Look Cinema, which is just like a dine-in theater train here. They had how they're doing Wicked Wednesdays, Matt, and they had Halloween three, and I've never seen it in a theater, and I was so excited. I even got one of my neighbors all excited to go, so he went with me, and it didn't work. Oh. The DAC file hard drive that they had was corrupted, and would not play, so I did not get to see my Halloween three. And it was that even sucks. more infuriating about it at the Look Cinema. First off, good on you; they actually were masking the screen. Oh wow. The aspect ratio with the curtains adjusted from trailer to trailer to and then to the film. And I was so excited about it. I actually said out loud, holy F, they're actually masking the screen. <laughs> and uh, and then nothing. Nothing. Viper Video Pick of the Week. I'm going to go with the British horror film Inbred. Four young offenders, Matt, and their care workers visit the remote Yorkshire village of Mort Lake, which prides it on keeping it to itself. A minor incident with the locals rapidly escalates into a blood-soaked, deliriously warped nightmare. The uh, box cover tagline, Matt, being, they came in peace. They left in pieces. Matt, what should we mm-hmm. be streaming this week? So I'm going to recommend the uh, geriatric action film, or at least has the tropes of an action film, Thelma. I had a lot better time with it than I had uh, thought I would. It's only available on Hoopla right now, so if your library has Hoopla, you get to watch it for free. But, uh, yeah, hopefully it'll become more broad soon. Yeah, Hoopla's great, man. You got a library card. You have access to a whole ton of great things on there. Yeah. And you can, they have, like, a Apple TV app. They have a Fire Stick app. You know, it's just like any normal streaming service. You just have to have a library card, folks. It's fantastic. Yeah, we watched that here. Mrs. Uh, first Run, I had her watch it. She uh, really enjoyed it as well. So... Nice. Good pick, Matt. Again, that's ViperVideoTampa.com. Reach out to Shelby. Tell him Chris sent you, and he'll say who. All right, let's go ahead and uh, wrap up the big show as uh, Matt and I share our five favorite body horror films. Here's one that didn't quite make the cut for uh, good old Uncle Chris. They come from the unknown, and they're here now. 
hiding, waiting to strike. You can feel their presence all around you. Never before have you come this close to the edge of terror. Never before have you faced anything so strange and sinister, so bizarre and unnerving. Never until now. David Cronenberg's The Brood. The Brood. Matt, that is an honorable mention for me. Cronenberg's The Brood. Got some weird, freaky kids in that one. We have a friend of the show who her thing is kids, like scary kids in horror films. She can't handle it. And I brought her to go see the orphanage back in the day, and she was mad at me for like two weeks. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, Brew didn't make the cut, but an honorable mention for me. Matt, I'll go first. I'll give you the uh, ultimate number one okay. because I am uh, that kind of guy. Uh, I'm going to go. I have a... Uh, I have a mix of things. Some things I want to promote that people may not be familiar with. And then um, other stuff that, you know, kind of lazy layups. So uh, my number five then is uh, Fruit Chan's Dumplings, which I think pairs well with Mm. the substance. uh, Where there is a a former actress who is desperate to kind of win her husband back. She's older now. She's not getting as much work. He is kind of stepping out on her and she just wants to be younger again so she meets a uh, former gynecologist who has this miraculous way of restoring your youth with these special dumplings that she has and you eat them and all of a sudden you get younger and healthier and stuff it's just that what the uh dumplings are made out of Eh, well you know do the math on that person's former career (laughs) So uh, Dumplings from 2004, which I believe is on Netflix right now, is a really kind of, I think, subtly disturbing, unsettling, body horror film. I think it just pairs really well with the substance okay. uh, to see how different cultures kind of handle this similar thing. So that's why I wanted to make it my number five. Yeah, I've never never seen that, so I'll have to check it out. Mm. All right, so that my number five is a, a film that we did for the show a few years ago. Raw is my number five. Mm-hmm. It is the story of a strict uh, vegetarian vegan who, you know, is going to veterinary school. She um, falls into peer pressure and she eats some raw meat, and that awakens something in her to where not only does she become a ravenous carnivore. Animal meat doesn't really seem to do it for her. And she starts going deeper and deeper into uh, satisfying her urges in other ways. It is a just a wild, disgusting, cannibal, pseudo-werewolf type thing. And it's, it is uh, quite a, a something to check out. And I, I think... She, the, the director, Julia Durkenau, has a, another film that I think might make it onto Chris's list. You know what? It's an honorable mention for me. Okay. All right. The fact that neither of her films are on here, I am a little embarrassed. They are both honorable mentions for me. But uh, yeah, no, it didn't quite make the cut for me. Again, I was deep. And man, I'm looking at my list now. That's, outside of number five, I think the rest of my films are always, are all 80s films? Well, there really? you go. That's, that's okay. me. All right. My uh, uh, number four, then, is if I, is the first film that pops in my head when somebody says body horror. And it's not... Here's the thing. It's not a great film. It isn't. Mm. But it's so unsettling and gross. Some of the effects are very effective. Is that... That's, man, that's poorly stated. <laughs> but other of them are not very effective. But it is so bizarre... And it is one of those classic USA Saturday Nightmare films. Probably the first and last time anything Billy Warlock starred in will sh- f- pop up on this show. And it's a Brian Usna's society. Mm. There is something weird going on in this Beverly Hills uh, mansion. And uh, Billy there, played by uh, Billy Warlock, is 
stumbles onto something weird involving the uh, rich folks in Beverly Hills called the shunting. And I really don't want to mention anything about what it is. You've actually have probably seen memes about this film without maybe even knowing what it is. Okay. And the stinger is pulled directly from this film this week. So stay tuned for the end of the episode so you get a little taste of the madness that you will be experiencing. But I remember watching this as a kid, like 14 or something on USA, and I'd be like, dear God, what the hell is this film? And uh, I've always loved it ever since. So Society is my number four. Have you ever seen Society? You must have. I haven't. I haven't. Oh. I haven't seen Society. It's on my list, but I've not got, never gotten around to watching it. Right. All right. So then my number four is a, a film that we did again for the show. Uh, it came out a few years ago from baby Cronenberg. Uh, little Cronenberg Jr. Brandon Cronenberg and his, uh, was it his directorial debut or was it just his first kind of like big wide, wide-ish release uh, with Possessor? It is a film about corporate assassins who take over people's bodies so that they can go out and uh, kill their marks or their targets. And uh, hyper-violent, incredibly graphic, really freaking weird, and uh, I I quite enjoyed it quite a bit. I don't know if... I think Chris liked it. I don't think he was as sold on it as hard as I was, and it's not something that he would necessarily watch again, but... It's twisted in all the right ways for me. Yeah, no, nah, that was like I think I described it as the first uh, pro f- family annihilator film that I had ever seen, <laughs> and uh, it really upset me. Mm-hmm. I bought it digitally, I think, because it was on sale for five bucks, the unrated version, mm-hmm. which I don't. Well, no, the unrated cut was the one we saw. That's right. So, uh, but I was like, I don't know if I'm ever going to want to rewatch this. But then, like five bucks, I may want to reexamine it. So I did pull the trigger on that i did stop myself from buying the second site like you know 50 dollars deluxe 4k edition though again that just would have sat on my shelf i think forever without me pulling it down so all right my number three then is gonna be and it probably wouldn't have been in my top five except that i revisited about four months ago because i got the 4k set and i finally cracked it open and watched it and the 4k restoration of hellraiser matt was Mm. I, it's like I'd never seen the film before. Really? The picture quality is so good. It blew my mind. It was just added levels of depth and clarity and ick, you know, that I never really saw before. And I just became, and I, I gotta say, I've probably seen Hellraiser four or five times in my life before this. But I also was the first time, probably in the last two viewings of it, two, three viewings, where I actually sat down and really just took it in, you know? Mm hmm. I wanted to experience that 4K transfer, and it's still it's just as effective today as it was back then. Perhaps even more so now, because this is the best looking version of it I have ever seen. Mm. So, if you have not picked up Arrow's uh, 4K Hellraiser set, I think they have a smaller, cheaper version of it now. Okay, do not hesitate. Okay, grab it because it is it's a revelation for the film, and uh, it made it my number three. And if you have, I mean, I'm talking more about the transfer, for, but the Hellraiser itself, the, the experience with the body horror, the torture, where it's basically that, what is it? The torture that you could perform on yourself, which brings you closer to heaven or to mm-hmm. hell. I mean, it's all very, you know, it's Clive Barker at his it's Clive all very Barker stuff. Yeah. 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 Very true. So, anyway, there you go. All right. So my number three then. So I, Christy. I, Sorry, <laughs> I, uh, I, Debated back and forth on this film. I don't like this film. It is a bad (laughs) film. (laughs) Um, And there are a lot of films that are absolute stone cold classes, but we really talk about those films a lot and they did get into my, you know, honorable mentions list. But when I think about body horror, there are a few films that come up and this one is one of them because it is so pointlessly disgusting and cruel and gross and of course, I'm talking about Human Centipede, where a a Jeez. a mad scientist kidnaps two women and a man, and decides that he is going to uh, mutilate them so that they can't get away, and sew their mouths together, <laughs> one's mouth to the another one's anus, in a little daisy chain of disgustingness, and. Uh, 
it's it is wild. I, now, and granted, Human Centipede two, I don't even want to talk about, but Human Centipede is not a good film, but it is an experience, and it definitely fits the the idea of body horror. I think incredibly well. I can't remember if I saw the second film. Do we do the second one for the show? Um, I can't remember. I don't know if I've seen the second film. I know I haven't seen the third one. Mm. I know that for a fact. I think you saw the second film, but told me not to see it because it's that bad. And I've just heard of things about it. Hmm. Have you gone hysterically? Have you hysterically lost it? Have I hysterically lost it? Who knows? I can't get the site to load right now. I was going to do a search on the site, but I can't get it Mm. to load to see if it's on there. Yeah, no, that is... (sighs) see i've like the stuff i'm recommended i think is something you, you stuff you should check out i don't know if i can recommend you ever checking that <laughs> film out it's but if you really want to take like body horror to an extreme where it is your your body and its functions are completely against you i feel like that's that's one that has to be on the list no i mean you're right about that yeah, I'd prefer not to just list off really disturbing body horror films, but <laughs> well, yep, here... we did do it for the show, episode one hundred and fourteen. Okay. Wow, I just I just blocked it out of my head. And we used to do news too. Like I used to have a, a column where I do little news articles on mm-hmm. things, mm-hmm. and one of them is smile. It's human centipede three. <laughs> <laughs> so uh... wow. Back when I had no life. Twenty twelve. I don't was I was I even on the show? My Emmy was a year old at that point. Oh, probably not then. Let me see what it says. If there's anything to write up. Uh, the write up isn't coming up either. It's in the it's in the summary or it's like in the search, but it doesn't say anybody's it, none of our names in it are in it. All right. Yeah, I can't get the the mobile version. It doesn't give me anything. Great website you got there, Chris. All right. <laughs> Boy, I'm glad I'm paying for that. What else? Where are we? Number three? I'm yeah. going to go ahead and I should say we are paying for that. Andres Jelaski's Possession. Mm. Sam Neill. Isabella Johnny. About a spy who comes home and his wife wants a divorce. Something's going on with her. And brother, you have no idea. So uh, I'm, that's all I want to say. The particular the scene at the end when he walks. Well, I just possession. I've been second sight supposedly has a uh, 4K transfer they're working on for this. That's why I haven't imported the germ. Is it Australian? I think it's Australian one because I want to get second sight set, which I'm sure is going to be gorgeous. I haven't heard anything in a while though, but it took him a while to get that hitcher set done, which I think is gonna. I should have in my hot little hands in about two weeks. Mm. But. uh Possession is one of those films that just, again, blew my mind when I saw it originally. And it is just so, just how stark that film is. The the cool color palette and how just unsettling and nihilistic a film that is. And it's just, just I don't know, it had to be on there. So Possession is my number two. Okay. Well, my number two then is Chris's number three. It's Clyde Barker's Hellraiser. Um, I think I wanted to put this one on here just because, A, I love the film. B, it is a much different approach to body horror in the sense that it's, you know, got this psychosexual aspect to it and it's supernatural and, you know, it's got this kind of weird cosmology about it that I think is really fascinating and just this whole idea of blurring the line between pleasure and pain and whether you're going to these extremes is just uh it's a pretty interesting idea in my in my uh, view it's unfortunate that Clive Barker really ruined this this series <laughs> um <laughs> as in, in some of the later works he did in it but this kind of first entry i think is is the bee's knees it's the tits if you will <laughs> i think the second one's pretty good mm. I like the second one, but yeah, it's not yeah. bad. I meant more like the the uh, he wrote a book called the Scarlet Gospels, which is a great oh. name, but it's it is so bad. It is so bad. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Where am I? One. Yeah, Matt. What's my number one? 
I think it's the thing, but it I, is. <laughs> it's John Carpenter's a thing. It's yeah. You're gonna talk about layups of layups. When you mm-hmm. have this alien creature that is able to mimic who you are, turn into you uh, so perfectly that you may you don't even know. Your yeah. friends certainly don't, and you attempt to kind of dominate the planet. And Carpenter's reboot, remake, whatever you want to call it, one of the first horror films I ever saw, and the practical effects on that thing. The, the, it's one of my all-time favorite films. I watch it four times a year, probably at least. And it's just a perfect little, like, uh, uh, Ten Little Indians, if you're familiar with what is the Agatha Christie, Agatha Christie story, like who is the bad guy, who it is, who they got to figure out who the monster is. But with some of the greatest practical effects you'll ever see in a horror film. And uh, so the thing is my one. Yeah, so I... I, I, I mean, this would have been my automatic number one, and some of my honorable mentions would have been like two, three, whatever. So I just left them off just because we talk about them a lot. So, but the thing is, Smart. a fantastic film. And, you know, if you've listened to the show at all, I mean, you would, I, I would think you would have seen it by now because we talk about it so damn much because it's yeah. that damn good. Uh, but my number one then is the, when anybody says the words body horror film, it's the one that comes to mind immediately. And that's a uh, Cronenberg seniors remake of the fly where Jeff yeah. Goldblum plays a scientist who has uh, teleportation technology and he decides to test it on himself and a fly gets in there with him and it splices the DNA together. His whole transformation of, you know, um, his teeth falling out and him yeah. putting like pieces of himself in the medicine cabinet and marking when it fell off. And even that whole thing where he uh, has the arm wrestling contest and he breaks that dude's hand <laughs> like wrist. It is just, it's just stuff that made me cringe as a kid. And you know, the, the birth scene, all that stuff is just, it's just, it is oh. the quintessential body horror film for me. Yeah, it really should be in my top five, if not my one. It's probably more body horror than The Thing is, really. Mm. I think Matt's right about that. I have not watched The Fly, which is weird, but I have not watched it, I think, for probably 30 years. Mm. And I feel like I, I, I want to revisit it for sure. It's in my honorable mentions, and if I had any integrity, I'd probably <laughs> have to agree with Matt that it would be my number one. It should mm. be. But yeah, for honorable mentions for me, Matt... I would include um, another, uh, uh, is it used in a film or is it a, I don't know, From Beyond, another great Mm -hmm. 80s horror film. Uh, Glazier's Under the Skin with Mm -hmm. Scarlett Johansson, I would include on there. I like uh, um, Guns Slither a lot. Kevin Smith's Tusk is not without its redeemable points. Another video, uh, video drum, another Cronenberg film, video drum I have mm-hmm. on there, Tetsuo of the Iron Man. I'm probably mm-hmm. just going to go through my entire honorable mention list. Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Titan, that's the Julie Darker Now film that Matt was referencing before that he threw on my list. Reanimator, we talked about the blob earlier today. Um, Malignant. And then a fun little story for me is one night, um, friend of the show, same friend of the show, who I took the orphanage. Her, her and I went out to like a Chili's one night and got loaded like on a school night and we were both so hung over. We both called mm. out of work the next day and we hung out and watched the movie Teeth and mm. uh, with an absolute blast watching that. So uh, that's that's my list. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, most of what Chris mentioned is on there. The only thing I'll put out there is uh, Alien, obviously, a uh, especially with oh, the yeah, kind of, of course. Whole- uh, you know, mouth rape analogy <laughs> that they've got going on in there, and uh, a film that is a. I'm surprised to make uh, Chris's list at all, and it's much more of a campy, hokey uh, horror film. But the stuff where uh, people sit there and eat this random, delicious marshmallow fluff looking s- stuff, and it basically, uh, you know, consumes them. I am so upset that I forgot about Larry Cohen's stuff. I what's so funny is I almost bought the Blu-ray on that like a week ago. I have it on DVD, mm-hmm. um, but I almost upgraded that because I do love the stuff. How did I forget the stuff? Oh man, <laughs> I'm very disappointed Don't beat in myself. Up. I'm just—it's the teeth pain, man. That's what it mm-hmm. is—the tooth pain. 
All right, there you go, folks. What's your favorite body horror film? Shoot us an email at feedback at thefirstrun.com. Uh, as always, we'd love to hear from you. What's coming up next week on The Big Show, Matt? Oh, it's a big one, isn't it? It is a big one in the sense that it's a the return of a a legendary filmmaker, and it's going to be so, so long. <laughs> Francis Ford Coppola's Megalopolis, three-plus hours of... I'm not even sure what the hell this thing is about. Some kind of modern Rome thing? I don't even really know. But uh, we're going to watch it, and we're going to talk about it. It's supposed to be, yeah, like a, I think it's supposed to be an allegory about the fall of Rome and gotcha. kind of applied to modern times or future modern times. I, I don't know. Sure. But, yeah, we'll see uh, how that all shakes out. Hopefully, my theater won't be destroyed in some kind of hurricane. So far, you know, fingers crossed, things don't look to be that bad for Tampa. But we'll see. You never know. Wish us luck. And uh, that, I guess, will be that. In the meantime, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, Facebook, did I say everything? Sure. Uh, just do a search for the first run. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Eventually, you'll find us. Head over to Apple Podcasts and give us a review. It'll help other people find the show. On thefirstrun.com, you can find archives when, they, when the website loads. Uh, you can find archives of all the old shows. Look at the report card. And there's an old mini player there. I just hit play, and I'll just start playing episodes. You can uh, listen to your heart's content. Listen to Matt and I our dulcet tones to help you fall asleep. I don't know, whatever you want to do. So uh, that'll be that. All right, folks, we're going to go ahead then, take an extended break. We love you all very much. Take care, stay safe, and we'll see you all soon. How do you like your tea? Cream? Sugar? Or do you want me to pee in it? Yeah, class act, Larissa.